Every night, I take the same way home from the tavern. I work there, washing dishes, sweeping floors, bussing tables. You know, busy work. It doesn't pay well, the patrons usually smell terrible, and I'm always there until at least midnight. But it's better than nothing. You see, I've got a bit of a gambling problem, and it's gotten me in some, well, financial trouble. I've acquired quite a debt with this one local crime lord named Barrett the Butcher, and recently his henchmen have been frequenting the tavern that I work at. They stay for hours at a time and are always the last patrons to leave, another reason that I'm always leaving so late. I can't tell if it's just coincidental or whether it's a genuine threat, but either way, I can't help but feel a little paranoid on these late night walks home. It doesn't help that on one particular part of my trip, I find myself passing what I'm sure was once a beautiful castle. Now it's more like something out of a horror movie. The type of place on the outskirts of town where you'd expect the local mad scientist to be cooking up some kind of Frankenstein-esque creature. But I certainly can't imagine that anyone actually lives there. Oddly enough, there's always a light coming from this one window way up high on the side of the building. Stranger still, I can always hear the faint sound of violin music as I pass by from the road beneath. I'm always tempted to get closer to hear the music better, or at least to determine that I'm not just imagining it. But the sensible side of me, small as it may be, always keeps me from wandering over, especially at this hour of the night. But tonight, the music seems more enticing somehow. I wish I could put it into words, but it's really so difficult to explain. I know that it's just a violin, but it feels as if someone's calling my name. I have no doubt that my curiosity would have surely gotten the better of me someday anyway. It might as well be tonight. As I approach the medieval-looking building, the music only continues to get louder. At least I can confirm that this isn't just my imagination. I reach the exterior directly underneath the illuminated window and heard something strange. A grinding, scratching noise, like the sound of old machinery working in a factory. It's accompanied by a dull humming or groaning, so quiet that it's almost completely overpowered by the violin music. Now that I'm closer, I can tell that the light is coming from some sort of flame by the way that the glow flickers and dances. Either candles or lanterns, but definitely nothing modern, that's for sure. Against the warm orange glow, I can also see the shadow of a figure. It's small, either a child or an animal. Although, I doubt an animal is capable of playing the violin, so I'm leaning more towards the first suspicion. Yes, now that I'm finally up close, I can see that it is, in fact, a child playing the instrument. From the look of the shadow, it's, I'd venture a guess, probably a little girl. No more than eight or nine years old. Around the shadow of the little girl, I see other shadows. Larger shadows. They appear to be human, but the way that they move, well, it's certainly not natural. I'm able to draw my attention away from the hypnotizing melody to watch the shadows moving against the candlelight. My imagination might be playing tricks on me, but I swear it looks like dozens, maybe more, of whatever those things are, moving and swaying to her song. The longer that I watch the shadows, the more I can visualize the correlation of the movements with the groaning, scratching noise from earlier. Whatever those things are, I know for certain now that they aren't human. At this point, the song draws to an end, and now more creeped out than ever, I find myself backing away from the building, eyes fixed intently on the window. The hair on the back of my neck was standing on end, and I can feel my heart beating in my throat. I definitely feel as if I've just seen something that I shouldn't have. As I'm moving backwards towards the road, I'm intercepted by a collision with something large and solid. I whirled around to see one of the thugs from the tavern, a dry and menacing grin forming on his lips, and two of his cronies walking up beside him. My eyes quickly shot from the thug to the window that I had just been watching. No light. No shadows. No music. Nothing. A creeping, sickening feeling spread through my stomach and I could feel the color drain from my face. Not only was I crazy, but now I was out here all alone, and there was no one nearby who could help me, or even hear me if I were to scream for help. The two thugs behind the brick wall of a man that I had first collided with slowly pulled items from the inside of their jackets. A rope, and a knife. I doubt they want me dead at this point. Their boss most likely is more interested in me paying my debt than me being dead. I have no friends or family, so killing me won't teach anyone a lesson, and it certainly won't get him his money back. I don't doubt, however, that the thugs were instructed to put me in as much pain as possible. 
and then deliver me alive to their boss. At least, if I were a crime lord, that's what I would tell them to do. Either way, none of the possible outcomes of this situation end with me finishing my walk home and sleeping peacefully in my own bed tonight. With very limited options for escape, and almost none for self-defense, I found myself once again underneath the window that I had been watching for the past few minutes. This time, with my back against the cold stone wall, and several large and intimidating men moving towards me with malicious intent in their eyes. I sunk back, sliding to the ground and covering my head with my arms. I don't care to see their faces as they do whatever they have planned to do to me. I'd rather just get it over with. I can hear the crunching of gravel as they move towards me, and the low chuckles under their breath, when suddenly, a familiar sound echoes all around me. The violin. The footsteps stop, and I hear sounds of confusion. Not that I am not confused myself. Then, in addition to the violin, the low grumble of the groans from before began to grow louder and louder all around me. The grinding, scratching noise approached from all angles, and I heard sounds of terror and dismay coming from the thugs. I slowly pulled my head from my arms and opened my eyes to see what was unfolding around me. Behind the thugs was the little girl, playing that sweet song on her violin. She was thin and frail looking, with long black hair to match her black dress. It was very evident, however, that she was no ordinary little girl. The skin of her face was black and white, resembling a skull, and her large round eyes glowed red in the light of the moon. Her skin was pale, or maybe even completely white, and her expression was cold and unfeeling. But that wasn't the part that made my stomach turn, nor was it the source of the panic from the three grown men. Surrounding us was what appeared to be not dozens, but hundreds of the creatures that had been casting the shadows in the tower just moments ago. Grotesque, human-like creatures with dark gray rotting flesh and hollow white eyes all moving slowly as if bone by bone towards the thugs. The way the creatures moved made my stomach turn, and it was now painfully evident where the noises from earlier were coming from. Each movement they made appeared to be a pop or a crack of a bone, snapping and then grinding against another bone to move them forward. I watched in terror as the men all drew guns from their belts and began shakily firing at the creatures until the creatures had completely surrounded them. It wasn't long after until they had run out of bullets and the creatures had completely enveloped two of the thugs. The final thug screamed and turned to me, reaching out his hand as he succumbed to the groaning dark mass of flesh that pulled him into their midst. His screaming slowly faded and I turned my eyes to the girl, still playing her song, her expression remaining blank and unfeeling. I couldn't move even the smallest of muscles to blink my eyes as the music drew to an end. I scanned the crowd of monsters trying to determine how long it would take for them to reach me, but to my surprise, as the music stopped, so did they. The groaning and scratching ceased along with the sound of the violin, and just as quickly as they had appeared, they were gone, almost as if they had sunk into the earth itself. The girl slowly lowered the violin to her side as she stood before me. We were the only two left. All traces of any other humans or the monsters that attacked them were gone. I stared at her, her sunken red eyes locked on mine before she turned to walk back to the entrance of the building. Wait! I involuntarily blurted out before scrambling to my feet. Why did you do that for me? I don't even know your name! She stopped, turning her head to look at me before responding coldly. Darcy. I started to walk towards her, holding out my hand for a handshake. My better judgment all but gone at this point. Darcy? What a pretty name! Uh, what are... I mean, who are you? And what were those things back there? I lowered my hand and froze as her blank expression turned into a glare, and she bitterly responded. I'm a gimberling. Those things are monsters. I don't know where they come from. All I know is that they like it when I play this violin, and that they'll do whatever I want as long as I play it. That's all you need to know. She finished as she was once again turning to go back inside the building. Wait! I blurted out. She stopped again and turned her icy stare back to me as I pressed further. What's a gimberling? And you never told me why you saved me. Why are you out here? Are you all by yourself? What can I do to repay you? Growing more and more annoyed, she clenched her small fist around the neck of the violin, scowling at the ground as she sighed. A gimberling is something, or rather someone, 
created with a purpose. The people who created me created me so that I could play this violin for them, so that I could control these monsters for them. I'm here because they put me here to play this violin and keep the monsters happy. She shook her head and locked her eyes onto mine. I saved you because you're the only one besides the monsters who have been able to hear my song. My creators needed me to play this violin for them because no one else besides me has been able to hear the music that it makes. I saw you at the window and knew you were drawn there by the music, so I thought, you must be like me somehow. That's why I saved you. She slowly unclenched her fist and shook her head. No more questions. I don't know if I was supposed to save you. The monsters will get restless if I don't play my song again soon. You should leave and don't tell anyone what you saw here tonight. With that, she turned and walked inside without giving me time to respond. Maybe that was for the best. Maybe she was right, and I shouldn't know about any of this. It's probably for the best that I don't learn any more than I already know and just be grateful that she saved me. I made my way home, the things that Darcy had said weighing on my mind. She said that I shouldn't have been able to hear the violin music, but I did, and that the reason she was created was because she can hear the music too, and her creators need her to play the violin because of it. I wonder if I can play that violin too. I mean, I don't have any formal training playing the violin, but I don't suppose she does either. As I laid down in my bed to get some sleep, I thought to myself, Barrett is going to wonder why his henchman never brought me back to his headquarters and will most likely send more after me shortly. If they think that I might be a threat now after making three of their men disappear, their focus might turn into killing me rather than getting the money back. I'm definitely not safe. I closed my eyes, my thoughts spinning as I tried to force myself to sleep. Hmm. Having those monsters under my control, even if only for one night, could be the answers to my predicament. If I could use them to get rid of Barrett and his men, all of my problems would be solved. I wonder if Darcy would let me borrow the violin. Of course not. She said that she literally only lived to play that thing. But it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. I'll go over there tomorrow evening before sunset and try to take the violin when she isn't playing it. I'm sure she'll understand. She has to sleep sometime. The next day, I went about my afternoon normally. As I walked through the streets of the town, I heard murmurs and whispers all around the town of three men disappearing. I couldn't help but smile to myself a little. It was a reminder that soon, I wouldn't have to worry about any of those thugs anymore. I waited until dusk and headed to get the violin. When I arrived, there was no music to be heard. Perfect. She must be sleeping, if she does that. I don't know. At least she isn't playing it right now. Surely she won't miss it if she isn't playing it. I made my way to a first floor window and pushed it open, making my way inside. It was odd, but the whole place seemed to be deserted. No Darcy, no monsters, no music, only silence. I made my way up to the room that I had seen her in the night before. After pushing the door open with a gut-wrenching creak, I found myself inside of what looked almost like a dungeon or possibly somewhere where devil worshippers might meet to sacrifice sheep or something similar. A circular room with stone floors and walls lined with unlit candles. The room was empty except for a small stone pillar in the very center, and on top of the pillar I saw the violin. After a brief moment of confusion, I lifted the violin from its resting place. I stared at it for a moment, turning it over in my hands, trying to determine somehow how something so innocuous could summon such terrifying creatures. On the back of the violin, the words Bylead and Marb, the Ballad of the Dead, were engraved in elegant lettering. After a moment, I shoved it into my backpack and made my escape down the stairs and out of the building, all the way back home. My heart was pounding in my chest, but it felt more like excitement than fear. I decided that while I was running off of this pure adrenaline high, that this would be the ideal time to go confront Barrett. I adjusted the straps of my backpack and headed to the shop that I had first visited back when I needed to borrow money from him in the first place. It was a seedy-looking bookstore with a large back room where Barrett and his henchmen used as a headquarters. I pushed open the door to the store, looking around for any innocent bystanders that may be inside perusing the shelves. The store appeared to be completely empty, even of a shopkeeper. Moving toward the dark red door in the back corner of the store, I unzipped the backpack and pulled out the violin, as well as its bow. 
Surely it couldn't be too hard to play this thing. As I turned the knob and opened the door, I felt every set of eyes in the room turn to look at me. About seven thugs sat around a round table playing a card game with a bald, rough-looking man in a white suit sitting at the head of the table. Barrett. A few of the men began to rise to their feet, but froze as Barrett let out a sharp whistle. He gestured at them to sit back down and instead rose to his feet and held out his hands in greeting. Well, well, well. Look what the cat dragged in. I have to admit, I was starting to get a little worried that my men weren't able to find you last night. Although, uh, I must say, they left you in better shape than I thought they would. He chuckled to himself, reaching in his pocket and pulling out a large cigar. He lit it and took a draw from it, chuckling again as he exhaled and pointed to the violin. Finally come to square up your debts, I see. Are you planning on paying me with a song? Or maybe that violin of yours is more valuable than it seems. I couldn't help but grin at his arrogant statement as I placed the violin on my shoulder and pressed the bow to the strings. As I prepared to play the first note, I laughed. <laughs> more valuable than you could ever imagine. It'll be more than enough to square up my debt. With that, I moved the bow against the strings, moving back and forth in a gentle gliding motion as I had seen Darcy doing before. I could feel a lump in my throat form as I realized there were no sounds coming from the violin, and certainly no monsters appearing. Barrett raised an eyebrow at me, his arrogant, smoke-stained smile twisting into an impatient scowl. Is this some kind of joke? It's not even a working violin. It's a piece of rubbish. He growled as he gestured to his men to stand up. No, no, I promise. It's worth more than what it looks like. Um... I felt a bead of sweat run down the side of my face as I quickly shoved the violin back into my backpack. I'm so, 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 so sorry. I forgot to have the strings replaced before bringing it to you. It's a family heirloom, worth what I owe, plus interest. In fact, I'll go have it restrung at my own cost and bring it into you next week. I just wanted you to see that I'm honest about repaying my debt. To my surprise, Barrett nodded, and the thug sat back down. He took another drag of his cigar, running his hand over his shaved head as he laughed. How considerate of you. <laughs> he pointed at the violin in my hand. If either a working expensive heirloom violin, or your debt in cold hard cash isn't in my hand at the end of the week, I'll just take your arms and legs as payment instead. He sat back down and picked up his hand of cards. Now get out of my sight before I change my mind. My hands were shaking as I stuffed the violin back into my backpack and hurried out the door, running as fast as I could until I made it back to the safety of my neighborhood. As I got to the alley leading to my house, I stopped. It might sound crazy, but I could have sworn that I heard the grinding noise from the night before. It must be all this stress getting to me. I quickly moved to my front door and unlocked it so that I could get inside. A few moments passed and I couldn't hear the noises anymore. I walked upstairs to my bedroom and set down my backpack, sitting on the edge of my bed and putting my head in my hands. Why hadn't the violin worked? Even if I didn't know how exactly to play it, surely it should have made a sound when I at least tried to play it. What am I going to do now? I have no doubt that the violin isn't worth nearly as much as I claimed it's worth. And even if it was, I'll never get it to make sounds that Barrett would be able to hear. So it doesn't matter anyway. I can't summon the monsters to take out the thugs, the violin is worthless, I'll never be able to come up with the money in a week, and before a week's time, Barrett will have realized that his goons from the other night never actually came back in the first place. What am I supposed to do now? My racing thoughts were interrupted by the sound of pounding on the front door. Not the sound that I wanted to hear. I cautiously picked up the pocket knife from off of my desk and moved downstairs as the pounding continued on the front door. I thought about asking who was there, but that seemed like a bad idea. So, instead, I silently looked through the peephole. To my surprise, the pounding stopped, and from what I could see, there was no one outside of the door. I bet this is just the thugs trying to give me a good scare for wasting their time earlier today. They're probably going to keep a close eye on me to make sure that I don't try to skip town. I opened the door to take a peek outside for a note, or to see if they had left a threatening mark on my door or something only to have the hair on the back of my neck stand up as I heard the grinding noise from outside again. I quickly slammed the door shut and locked it, putting the sound to a stop. My nerves must be more shot than I thought. I ran up the stairs to my room and closed the door, locking it as well. A good night's sleep should help me clear my mind. 
I turned off my light and laid my head on the pillow, closing my eyes, only to be awoken by more banging on the door. The pit of my stomach dropped, however, when I realized that this time the banging was not on my front door, but on my bedroom door. I stared in horror at my bedroom door. What choices did I have? I couldn't run. A jump from my second-story bedroom window to the stone ground below wouldn't be conducive for an escape. I've got nothing except for this pocket knife to fight back with. I succumbed to the fear and pulled the blanket over my head like a child. After a moment, the banging came to a stop. I could feel my heart pounding so hard that I was afraid that it might give out as I trembled in the dark silence. From the hallway outside of my room, I could hear a noise rising from the silence. The dull grinding noise, now accompanied by bellowing groans, slowly drew closer and closer to my doorway. I clenched my eyes tightly shut and began to recite the prayer my mother taught me as a child, my whole body stricken with fear. Before I knew it, the whole room was full of the increasingly loud groaning and grinding. Every inch of the room around me was full of the noise, and I knew I was surrounded. Before I could prepare myself, the blanket was ripped off of me and I was face to face with two empty white eyes resting in a mutilated pile of flesh that I'm sure used to resemble a human head. My heart seized in my chest as I was struck by the sudden realization that the face was familiar to me. One of the thugs from the night before. I didn't have time to dwell on the horror of what had become of one of my attackers before the other creatures that accompanied him had pushed and moved their way closer to me in a large, terrifying mass of bodies. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't find my voice as I felt their long, twisted, finger-like appendages grabbing at every part of me. Everything went suddenly black as I felt the ocean of rotting flesh that filled my room overcome me and completely suffocate me. The sound slowly grew quieter and quieter as I began to lose consciousness. It must have been hours, or maybe days later, but I felt myself slowly waking up. Before I had even opened my eyes, I was brought into consciousness by a very familiar sound. The sound of the violin. My whole body, even my eyelids, felt heavy, and I couldn't bring myself to open them. Pain radiated through my entire body, and my bones and joints ached like nothing I had ever felt before. I tried to remember what had happened the night before, but it was so hard to focus with someone playing that violin. I attempted to push myself up onto my hands so that I could rub my eyes and wake up, but felt my wrist buckle as I attempted to support myself on them. I groaned in pain and fell over on my side. Upon impact, I realized that the surface that I was laying on was not in fact my bed, but instead cold stone. Where was I? Better yet, where is that violin music coming from? I rolled over onto my stomach and forced myself to open my eyes. I groaned in pain again as I did so, because it felt like I was having to physically tear holes in my skin to open my eyes. What had happened to me? I froze for a moment as my eyes adjusted to the dim lighting. My eyes never fully came into focus, but amongst the blurry lights and shadows I could make out the flicker of candle flames all around me. In the center of the flickering, in the distance, was a figure. Are they the one playing the violin? I groaned again loudly in pain as I attempted to rise to my hands and knees, only to feel them dislocate, sending me into writhing agony. Who did this to me? Was it the thugs? I fell over on my side and began to crawl to the best of my ability towards the figure. As I drew closer, my blurred eyes struggled to make out who it was that was standing right in front of me. It seemed like all around me I could feel movement, but I couldn't turn my head to look around. Are there other people here? Maybe they can help me escape. With a sudden burst of energy and determination, I pushed myself to my feet. Every nerve in my body is on fire with pain, as it feels as if knives are being shoved into every muscle group in my body. I need to make it to that figure. They have the violin, I'm sure of it. It feels as if every bone in my body is broken, so I find myself leaning and pushing against the other people who are also trying to move, using them to help me to go forwards towards the source of the music. As I get a little closer through my milky, blurred vision, I'm able to make out the figure a little better. And when I do, I see a familiar face. Darcy. She's the one playing the violin. Oh my, huh? Oh, she must be very upset with me for taking the violin. But, but I think it's okay. The song she's playing, I, I think it's for me. In fact, 
I, I think she wants me to stay here with her now and listen to her playing this song. It sounds like it's meant for me. It sounds like it's calling my name.